welcome everybody. I, I should mention we're going to take questions at the end because I can't see the chat box as I give the presentation. Um, so thank you for, for coming virtually. Um, there we go, it's working. So for the past, uh, you know, every decade or two, um, major cities in the West Coast have earthquakes that are big enough to cause substantial damage and injury. And sometimes even up as many as 50, 60 people have died in these events. And about once a lifetime, we have the truly big quakes like the great San Francisco earthquake of 1906. And yet we still wanna live here, right? We still wanna be here. And the good news is that we can um, because there are precautions that we can take that will prevent or at least limit the negative impact of such quakes. There's a problem though. We all know that we're supposed to be taking these precautions but for a whole bunch of reasons, many people don't take them. Most people don't take them. And that's basically asking for trouble. So that's why we're here today. So I'm Matt Springer, as Laurie said, I'm a professor at UCSF. And the first thing I'll confirm for you is that no, we don't have seismology at UCSF. Um, the reason that I give these talks is because I have a lot of experience from what my own um, family has gone through in some of the large quakes in California. And I have a good idea of the kinds of problems that can occur and what we can do to uh, minimize them. And I'm sorry, uh, I've got my meeting controls just popped back up. I wanna get them out of the way. <laughs> okay, I guess that's gonna keep happening as more people join, <laughs> no problem. So without further ado then, um, let me tell you a bit about what I have experienced in these quakes in the past. So you get some idea of what you might experience. We'll talk about what to do during a quake, right after a quake, and then spend the rest of the time talking about precautions that you can take now. So there we go. Let's start with California. And I think that you all recognize California here, even though you don't see the state lines drawn, because we have a number of unique and recognizable features, right? We've got the, the bay, the central valley, the hills, et cetera. And what's important to realize is that these unique and recognizable features are caused by seismic activity. We've got uh, earthquake faults running up and down the state, and you can actually see them if you look closely, look at this um, satellite view, you can see a giant crack in the ground right there. Hopefully you can see my cursor. And there's another one, crack here, crack there. And if you look more closely at the, um, the Bay Area, you can see that we owe our existence essentially to these earthquake fault systems that you've no doubt heard about. The uh, San Andreas Fault, the Hayward Fault, Calaveras Fault, and the North Bay out, uh, offshoots. And if you take these lines away, look what happens. This is really cool. Look at the East Bay. You can still see them, right? The East Bay owes its, its topography to these earthquake faults. What I think is really neat though, is that a lot of what we know in the North Bay and the peninsula are indeed the San Andreas Fault. So the Tamales Bay that separates Point Reyes from everything else, that is the San Andreas Fault. And the uh, if you're driving on 280, the Crystal Springs Reservoir that you drive by and the, those, that, those lakes, that is the San Andreas Fault. And in fact, I had already started giving this talk so a number of years ago now, and I was flying out of San Francisco airport to a conference. And I looked out the window just in time to see this view. Uh, we've just left the airport, we're heading towards the ocean. So there's 280, there's the Crystal Springs Reservoir and the other lakes, one of which by the way is called San Andreas Lake, interesting. And two things occurred to me as I saw this view. First of all, well, there really is a giant water-filled crack running down the peninsula, right? And the other one that occurred to me was, did they really need to put a neighborhood right there? You know, I, I, I assume that those people know what they're sitting on, but I think that this kind of image gives you a, a good concept that we live with the effects of earthquakes every day in the Bay Area. And let me just uh, move something out of the way there. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the quakes that I myself have experienced and that you folks have experienced too in the state in the past several decades. Um, 1971, there was a uh, quake in Silmar, 6.6. For those of you that don't know the LA area, that's the LA basin, that's the San Fernando Valley. I grew up in the sleepy suburb of Northridge, which no one had ever heard of at the time, but that was of course going to change. Um, and in 1971, I looked about like that. I assume you can tell which of the people in that picture is me, uh, hopefully. And the reason that I like to show this picture is because then you won't think poorly of me when I tell you that in 1971, I was afraid of the dark, but not if I was in my bed, then it was okay. And so I had a habit 
of if, if I had to get up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, I would come back to my room. I would turn the light off, got dark. I would run through the room and dive into my bed and I would land in the bed and the bed would bounce up and down a couple of times when I did that. And one morning in 1971, I did that. I dove into bed, bed bounced up and down and it didn't stop. Just kept going. So I'm this little kid thinking, why is the bed not stopping? And my mother came to the door and said, Matthew, we're having an earthquake. We have to get under the table. And so my whole family went and got under the kitchen table and waited for it to finish. And we did okay in this quake. We had a couple of things fall off of shelves. We had some cracks in the patio in the back. You know, not that bad. Um, but then later on uh, that night, or maybe the next night, I'm not sure, our entire part of the valley was told to evacuate because there were cracks in the nearby Van Norman Dam or suspected cracks, and they were worried that the dam was going to burst. And so we had to evacuate and spend a couple of nights, I think, at our cousin's place on the other side of the valley. Um, they gave the all clear. We came back. No harm done, right? Now, not everyone was that fortunate. There were 65 people killed in this quake. Uh, there was a lot of damage. So here are some more interesting pictures of the damage that occurred, like the freeway interchange north of the valley that collapsed. They rebuilt it bigger and better, stronger than before. Um, and this, you know, I'm a professor at UCSF. This is notable for anyone who's involved in hospitals, because that is a hospital near the epicenter. That's a whole building. The hospital fell over. And we are still experiencing the effects of this event today, because as the decades go on, the standards, the seismic standards for hospitals get higher and higher and higher. And so a lot of the hospital construction that you've seen around the the, the San Francisco in the last couple of decades is all due to this. We've got hospitals going up at UCSF main campus, you know, Parnassus Mission Bay, new buildings at San Francisco General, new buildings at the VA. It, it's all due to this event. Um, hang on. I, I keep having a, a little thing pop up on my screen that's annoying. I keep getting rid of it. So in 1989, as you know, we had our own earthquake, the Loma Prieta quake, 6.9 on the Richter scale, or thereabouts, depends who you talk to. And um, in 1989, here's the epicenter. And at that point, I looked like this. I'm showing you this, not just so I can show you my very cool sweater, but so that you can see how far away I was during this quake. I was down at Stanford. And so I'm pretty far away from the epicenter. And San Francisco and Oakland are even farther away. And we all got really shaken up by this quake, so a lot of damage. So 62 people killed in this quake, thousands of people injured in this earthquake. Um, this was a pretty surreal experience for me. I was actually walking across the campus. It was late afternoon and I was walking from the music building to the biology building and I was outside and there was no wind that I remember, but suddenly the leaves started rustling in the trees. And then the clock tower started chiming, the bell started chiming. And then the earth, the ground under my feet started moving. You could actually watch this, this thing roll across the landscape. It was incredible. And all the while, the only sound were the bells and the trees. There were not Hollywood sound effects or anything like that. Um, so I was fortunate to be outside. You know, bicyclists were falling all over and things like that. And there's a lot of damage at Stanford. They had buildings closed for many, many years, supports under arches and things like that. Um, here's some more damage. This is downtown Santa Cruz. And so, you know, we think of this as a San Francisco earthquake, but it was really a Santa Cruz earthquake. That's Santa Cruz right there. Here's downtown Santa Cruz, and it took them years to come back from this quake. This, of course, as many people recognize the Cypress structure, it was the Highway 80 double-decker freeway in the East Bay in Oakland. The top part collapsed in on the bottom part. Most of the people, or the largest number of people who died in this quake died here, actually including a UCSF fan pool of, of employees. Um, they've rebuilt this as a single story structure in a slightly different place. You certainly know this. Well, I, mean, I don't know. People who moved to the Bay Area in the last decade, maybe they don't. The, the uh, eastern span of the Bay Bridge used to look like that. I mean, it was double-decker. And the top part fell into the bottom. And uh, they, they closed it. And they realized that it would be cheaper to build a new bridge than to pr properly retrofit this thing. So they retrofitted the western half. They built that new eastern half that we have and then tore down the old one. Really incredible. And this is a very famous image, this type of image. This is the Marina District in San Francisco. The whole Marina District is landfill, and it did really poorly. And we'll talk about that uh, again in a couple of minutes. But first, 1994, everyone heard about my own hometown, Northridge, had a 6.7. 
So we're back down here. Now, I wasn't there for the Northridge quake, but my family um, was very, very much affected. My, my mother lost her apartment and everything, almost everything that she owned. In fact, a, a neighbor had to come and get her out because she was stuck and had kicked down the door. The neighbor kicked down her door. Uh, my dad spent a long time, days cleaning up the mess in his apartment. And I saw a lot of the areas that I recognized from my childhood on the news for various problems, fires, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm very familiar with this quake. Now in the Northridge quake, we had 51 people killed, several thousand people injured. And let's just pause for a minute because are, are you getting a deja vu sense? I keep showing similar Richter scale reading, similar you know, numbers of people killed, injured. And the way that I interpret this is that these are the quakes that are small enough that they happen with regularity, but large enough that they cause a lot of damage. OK, so I don't know if we're going to have a 1906 earthquake in our lifetimes, but you can pretty much bet we're going to keep having these. And that's one of the points, the bottom lines from this talk is that you have to assume that these things are going to happen and you need to be prepared for it. So let's see. Here's more damage, more damage photos. Remember that freeway interchange north of the valley that fell down in 1971, Silmar quake. It fell down again. <laughs> I'm sure they weren't expecting that, but it did. So we keep learning um, along the same lines. Well, here, here's here's the Northridge Fashion Center. That's Bullock's department store at the Northridge Mall where I used to hang out at as a teenager on Saturday afternoons. This was really surprising to people. This is Cal State Northridge. It's a parking structure. That was not a legacy old building. They had just put that up a year or two before the quake. And I'm, I'm sure they didn't think that this could happen, and yet it did. So we really do keep learning about how to build things as more and more quakes occur. And uh, of personal significance, this is the Northridge Meadows apartment. Um, this is a, like a poster child for this quake because that building is a three-story building. It used to be the same height as its neighbor. That's the third story. That's the second story. It all collapsed down on the first floor, which was a parking garage. And it's these so-called soft story construction buildings. Uh, you must have heard that term many times, where the first floor doesn't have nearly as much structural integrity. It's parking, it's sh shorefront, storefront, things like that, that are especially at risk in earthquakes. And if you kind of think for a minute that maybe half the buildings in San Francisco fit that description, right? So you can see we have a, a problem. Um, the reason that I say that this is personal significance is that I told you that my mother lost her apartment in this Northridge quake, but she was fortunate because she, when she moved out of the home where I grew up, she almost moved into this one and decided not to, moved elsewhere. She would have been in a first floor unit. So we're glad that she didn't. At any rate, um, I'm showing you a lot of a lot of scary photos. And the last thing I want to do is to make you freak out and jump up and run to the airport and move to the East Coast of the West, you know, the, the, the East Coast of the Midwest, where they also have earthquakes, by the way. Um, what I'm trying to do here is if you're not scared of earthquakes at all, I, I want to scare you a little bit. Okay. I admit it. If you are scared of earthquakes, I want to reassure you because most of the problems in earthquakes are preventable. And this is not what normally happens. I'm clearly showing you the most dramatic photos that I can find, right? Most of the damage that occurred in all of these quakes wasn't this. It was things falling over, things falling down, things flying through the air, the sort of thing that you can prevent against. And that's why you're here today. And I also want to say for legal reasons, if no other, that these precautions we're going to talk about, kind of like a seatbelt, they, they drastically reduce the chances that you will have a problem, but they don't guarantee that you will not have a problem. So I think you, you could see why I need to put that disclaimer in. So let's summarize. I, I should mention for, for people who have joined late, if, if you're putting things into chat or questions, I can't see them um, <laughs> as, as I'm in full screen presentation mode. So at the end of the talk, we're going to take questions just so people know. So to summarize what you've seen so far in two words, quakes happen. They always have, they always will. And let's just run through. We got the 6.6 .6 in 1971 down south. In 1989, we had 6.9 up here. 1994, 6.7. Um, in 2001, Seattle had a similar quake. They're capable of much larger quakes than we are. But that was a similar story to ours. Similar size, similar damage and injury. And in case you're curious for context, the great San Francisco earthquake of 1906 is thought to have been about an eight. And the Richter scale is a log scale. So you go up one, it's 10 times worse. It's a little bit of oversimplification, but that's a good way to think of it. 
And for further context, if you've been around for the last few, you know, a couple of decades, we've had a lot of little baby quakes. They're these little things that, you know, you 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 wake up, you feel something, you you hop on the computer, your Facebook is a earthquake, and then you go back to sleep, right? Um, and these little tiny things that get noticed, um, they keep on happening. And I'm pausing this in 2011 because what was really interesting at this point is you could look at this, and look at all these epicenters. You can see they're forming a line right? And these are forming a line. And you should recognize those lines because that's the San Andreas Fault and that's the Calaveras Fault. Nothing on the Hayward Fault yet, but then in 2011, we had a whole bunch of little quakes on the Hayward Fault. That's where they think has the biggest chance of the next big quake. Um, now, I'm no longer collecting these epicenters because it was turning into a mess, but I did add the 2014 Napa quake, 6.0. That was reasonably notable. There was some damage there. For further context, big, big, big quakes. In 2010, Chile had an 8.8 .8 that was tied for eighth largest ever recorded. Um, the Japan quake in 2011 with the huge tsunami and the nuclear problems, that was in a four-way tie for fourth largest ever recorded at a 9.0. And 2004, the Indonesia quake with the massive tsunami that, that ripped 400 miles of the Earth's crust, that was third largest ever recorded at a 9.1. You see, we've been having a lot of these big things. Um, in case you're curious, what is the largest quake ever recorded? Uh, Chile gets that distinction too. It's a 9.5. And I've heard that the planet is not capable of generating much more than a 9.5. So I thought it was notable that in the movie um, San Andreas with Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, uh, spoiler alert, there's a big earthquake or two. Um, the earthquake that they had there, the big one, was a 9.6, which I think was funny because it's almost like, okay, they want to be realistic. They just make a tiny little bit larger than the largest earthquake ever recorded. Not like most of the rest of the movie was realistic, but that's another story. Okay, so let's let's shift gears a little bit and talk about what you're going to experience depending on where you are. Now, if you're in San Francisco, I know some of you uh, who hooked up aren't. Um, this is a map of San Francisco showing the liquefaction potential. The, the potential for the ground to temporarily lose structural integrity and, and behave like a liquid, the water kind of comes out. The darker brown it is, the worse it is, okay? So you can see dark brown, light brown, pan, greatest areas of liquefaction are in the dark brown. Why does it look like that, you might wonder? Well, let's look at what San Francisco looked like before we started filling in the bay, and you'll see. Um, really fascinating, so for example, I told you the marina district is built on landfill. There's the marina then, there it is now. See how that works? And what was really interesting and ironic is that the marina was filled in for a 1915 Panama Pacific exposition to celebrate San Francisco's recovery from the 1906 earthquake. Um, didn't Wasn't tested till 1989 and, and didn't do well. Um, you ever wonder why they call Mission Bay, Mission Bay, considering that it's not a bay? Because it used to be a bay. That's Simple as that. So for those of you in that part of town or who know this area, um, all of Mission Bay is landfill, the hospital that touches down on real real ground. Um, and what's really kind of neat and a little scary is that this whole area, this you know the financial district, the waterfront, it's all landfill. And when they excavate for buildings there, they will sometimes uncover boats underground because landfill, is anything you use to fill in the water, at least in those days. Um, they've discovered piers, and it's really intense. Um, let's see, you probably, well, you might be able to read this on your, on your monitors, I'm not sure, but that says Great Sand Bank. So the whole Western part of the city is sand dunes, and sand dunes are stronger than landfill. The sand has been there for a much longer time, but it's still shifting. Um, you still have to be careful if you live out in that part of town that uh, you have to worry about shifting sands. So we're going to talk about that again in a minute, but let's look at Mission Bay, which is really interesting. And I, I used to live in Mission Bay, um, but it's it's still a really interesting thing to look at. Why are we building on landfill like this, given what happened in the marina? And in Mission Bay, we've got a university, a giant ballpark, a, a, you know, the, the, the new um, stadium, the Chase Center. Um, we've got condos, apartments, all sorts of things. Why are we doing that? And the good news is that we know much better now how to build on landfill than we used to. So if you're in Mission Bay, th this is the corner of Fifth and Berry, for those of you who know the area. I took this photo. 
number of years ago. They were just putting up the Avalon apartments there. You will see as they prepare to build, you'll see these 50 foot tall uh, steel or iron or sometimes cement piles that they hammer down all the way through the landfill until they go as almost you know, disappeared. And then they weld another one on top and then they keep on going cycle after cycle until they hit the point of refusal or, or bedrock. And it's not just a few of these, it's whole forests. So that bunch of them that went down, they then put these up afterwards. And I've heard that those buildings in Mission Bay and similar areas that are building, that they build these days, are around five to 600 strike points per building. So you can really think of those buildings as the tops of skyscrapers where most of the structure is underground and is sitting on solid ground. You know, what happened with the Millennium Tower that, that's tilting? They didn't go all the way to bedrock. They just went down with friction piles about 80 feet. And, and they're turns out that wasn't sufficient. But the things that they're building these days, they're going to bedrock. And in fact, Salesforce Tower, not only did they go to bedrock, but they drilled into it. So that thing is really anchored. So uh, in Mission Bay, what's really interesting is you can walk around and you can see that the ground around those reinforced areas is still sinking. So I took these pictures a number of years ago and then came back a year or two later to the same places, took those pictures. So you can see that the sidewalks and the streets are sinking and the buildings aren't. So that's actually a good thing because it shows you that the buildings really aren't sinking, right? They're not moving, but it, it obviously has other problems that they have to solve in those areas. Okay, what about the western half of San Francisco? You know, the whole western half was sand dunes. It was the outside lands, is what they called it in those days. And that's where they got the name for the uh, music festival in Golden Gate Park. That's the Sunset District in the 1800s, looking out towards the ocean. And I love this photo because this is taken from Golden Gate Heights, 15th and Ortega, looking towards the ocean. So you can see in the foreground, 19th Avenue, it's already there. And you can see Golden Gate Park. It's already there. Um, this is going to be the Sunset and Parkside districts. That's going to be the Richmond district. Well, like I said, sand is stronger than landfill. But if you think of those buildings that are on it now, they in many cases are older and were not built to any kind of seismic code. And so basically any building before the 1970s, and I hear it like in about 15 years ago, there was another in increase in, in standards. Um, you should really check to see if the building is seismically sound, foundations, et cetera, whether it needs to be retrofitted. We'll touch on that at the very end of the talk. Okay, so again, shift gears. What would you do during a big quake? And this is important because there are some really dangerous myths that have been out there for years. So if there was a sizable quake, let's think about this. Where are you? Or better yet, where, where are you not? You are not running out of the building. And this can be hard because there's millions of years of evolution in your head screaming at you, run out of the building, right? The fact is that at least in the industrialized countries, the most injuries occur when people are running from inside the building to outside the building, and they run through that danger zone that's right outside the building. That's where things are coming down, bricks, windows of you know glass if it's a problem, signs, stuff like that. That's where the debris is falling. And so this is a footage, I don't know if you can hear it or not. This is footage that I got from CNN after the New Zealand Christchurch quake, which is really neat because you can see what the people running out of the building and you can see exactly what they're running through to get there. And I gotta say, New Zealand, this was really interesting because we saw so many photos after that Christchurch quake of collapsed big buildings. And there were all these stories of people who got trapped in there. And even I started to think, gee, maybe this, advice not to run out of the building isn't good. And so I did a little bit more checking. And it turns out that all those pictures of the collapsed buildings in Christchurch were photos of the same four buildings. The vast majority of buildings in Christchurch did not collapse. The vast majority of the damage looked like this, right? And you could read about it in the news. They said there were bodies on the streets under the rubble. Um, so you, you, you don't want to, you don't want to be there. And this is a picture from the Napa quake in 2014. Right, you wouldn't have wanted to be running through that door to get outside. The building's still there. Here's um, back at the Loma Prieta quake. I told you that most of the casualties were in that collapsed freeway. The second largest number of people who died were the five people killed in South of Market, Sixth and Bluxem, when they were on the sidewalk and the facade collapsed on them. Okay, 
And here's a photo from Ecuador 2016. And you know, as as we see these pictures from quakes, yeah, you see some collapsed buildings, but you also see a lot of this. You don't want to be next to a building. Here's another one that's going to surprise people. You're not standing in a doorway. Okay. Big surprise because People in my generation, especially from Southern California, we were already taught, we were always taught to brace yourself in a doorway, right? That's based on a myth. Um, there, in, in the olden days, the buildings there were adobe, basically clay with wooden door frames. And they look better than this, but I'm not an artist. This is my, you know, adobe with a wooden door frame. And in those quakes, actually in one quake, I've, I've, I used to say in those quakes, but I've since heard in one quake, there was a famous picture apparently of the aftermath. And, the, the adobe had pulverized and all that was left were the door frames. So it made sense to be under the door frame in those days. But in a modern building, the door frame is no safer than the rest of the building. And if there's a door, it's going to slam shut and you know cause various problems for you. So you're not supposed to do that. So where are you? This is going to be amazing common sense, regardless of, you know, despite urban legends and spam that you get, you are under something sturdy like a kitchen table. And here's your first precaution, because you can look around today where you live, you know, later where you work, and decide if there was a huge quake right now, what would I get under? Right? What's accessible? What is hopefully away from windows? What's not going to collapse itself? And at work, how many of my coworkers am I going to have to fight off to be the winner to get under that one table in the middle of the room, right? I mean, these are actual <laughs> legitimate questions to ask. Now, some of you might be thinking, oh, what about this whole triangle of, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of my ahead of myself. They have said more recently, if you're in your bed, you might want to just stay there. If there's nothing on the wall above you, because apparently a lot of people have gotten injured in quakes by doing what my whole family did in the Silmar quake. We got out of our beds in one end of the home. We went all the way to the other end of the house, to the kitchen table. And uh, people get injured as during that transit. They're, they're going through uncontrolled area. So on your bed, you're on like a big bumper car. They say, just cover your head with a pillow, curl up and ride it out. So what I was, was starting to say is that there's this triangle of life concept, this thing that's been going around for years from, from a guy who says, I, I'm an earthquake expert. Um, and I've been to all these places where people get under things. And when the whole building comes down and the roof comes down, it crushes the thing. That they're under and it crushes them and they say instead you should get next to something so that when the whole roof comes down it it hits the thing you're next to and you're in this triangle that has been debunked it, it is flatly rejected by all of the mainstream emergency organizations here's a picture from cole lingo quake that i think is a great example of why you would not want to be next to a table you'd want to be under it right um and the red cross actually and the these other organizations have, have, have requested that if you get that that sometimes well-intentioned um, email to group reply up the chain and say, no, this is not correct. They've put together a website that goes through this very compelling sounding email point by point and rebuts it. And I have my own website. I link to theirs and I could talk about this all day and I'm not going to do it, but this gives me an opportunity to point out my Quake Tips blog, which is where I do talk about things like this in more detail. Um, there's currently, oh, I think over 700,000 views. I need to update that. But this gives you an idea of the kinds of topics that I post on. Uh, it's basically like a frequently asked questions before you've asked them. And actually, sometimes they're they're based on questions that I get. So this just gives you an idea. Um, I typically have posted to it less than once a month. More recently, it's been more like a couple of times a year. But it's interesting ways to get further information. And there will be times during this talk that I say, for more information, see the blog. Okay, really quickly, what about after a sizable quake? There's this controversy about gas, which is really frustrating because you'd think they'd be able to come to a consensus and there isn't. But if you, you have probably heard either <laughs> that when there's a quake, you should turn your gas off or you shouldn't turn your gas off, right? What the official... Um, advice from the utilities companies is that only turn your gas off if you suspect there's a leak. The reason for that is because if you do turn your gas off, they don't want you to turn it back on again. They want to come out and inspect the lines. After Loma Prieta, I hear it took PG&E and other, other you know, utilities um, three weeks to come and 
turn everyone's gas back on again. So you could have problems. You could you know, be very, very cold for a long time. Um, they say sniff for gas if you smell the gas additive smell. Um, if you see the meters are turning around, your gas meter for no apparent reason, if you hear hissing, right? Otherwise, they say don't do it. And this is a big controversy, especially now that we have these automatic gas shutoff valves. There's, there's no time in this talk really to go into it, but I spent a long time researching this and wrote a very long article on the blog about gas. And you might want to go and check it out. And you'll see that there's no perfect answer, but at least you'll be more um, you'll be more knowledgeable about it. Either way, if you do need to turn your gas off, know how to do it. Um, for typical smaller, you know, single family homes and some apartments, um, you'll see a gas meter, you'll see a pipe coming out of it, and you'll always see some kind of dial on it that has an obvious rod thing on it. If it's parallel to the pipe, it means the gas is on. If it's perpendicular to the pipe, it means the gas is off. It's very intuitive. What you might want to do, though, is you might want to take a wrench, and, and you have a wrench there, have a wrench chained to it, so you don't have to go searching for one, right? Check this. See if you can move it. Just take that wrench and turn it. Don't turn it off. Don't open that can of worms. Just turn it a little bit, maybe like an eighth of a turn. Chances are you won't be able to do it, because these things have usually frozen in place. And if you do need to turn off your gas and you can't, then you've got a problem. So if it turns out that you can't move it, um, call your utilities company and they will send someone out to free it up. Okay, so this brings us to the reason that we are here. Um, you've probably heard from relatives and friends in other parts of the country. It's like, why do you live in that place with earthquakes, right? And you probably said, well, why do you live in that place with hurricanes and tornadoes and killer storms and you know all these things that happen, floods? And they come back, at you and they say, well, at least we have warning. And with that, you figure, okay, now, <laughs> and, and, and you lose that argument, right? Well, I'm here to tell you, we, we do have advanced warning. And I'm not talking about the few seconds from the early warning systems. I'm saying we have a lot of advanced warning about earthquakes. There's gonna be an earthquake, do something about it. There, you've been warned, okay? But the problem is that it's not as simple as that, clearly. There are so many things you can do People look at these lists of things to do and they get overwhelmed and they say, well, I'll figure this out one of these days and one of these days never comes. And that's the problem. But what's important to realize is that some of these precautions are much cheaper and easier than others and much more important. So I have broken it down into categories from you've got no excuse not to do these things if you live in a place with earthquakes all the way down to, OK, if you've done everything else, what, what else can you do? So let's go through this in order. Most important thing I can tell you today, what to not have over your bed, okay? Here's, here's another anecdote. Um, during the Silmar quake, I have a relative who's younger than me. She used to spend, you know, go out into the hallway um, in the middle of the night and curl up outside her parents' bedroom. And during the Silmar quake, that I might have missed that, during the Silmar quake in 1971, um, they had heavy frame pictures in their hallway. And they jumped off their hooks, which pictures typically frequently do. And one of them came crashing down and missed her head by that much. So there was no harm done, but you can see the tragedy that could have occurred. I mean, you figure you've got your head right there, one third of your life. Okay, wait, what year is this? Okay, maybe one fifth of your life, right? Who, who are we kidding, right? But it's there a lot and it's usually asleep and you just don't want something can fall on it. So years ago, I had a tapestry over the bed. Since then, my more recent places, I just don't put anything over the bed. It's There's nothing there. It's not pretty, but, you know, it's okay. And also, you want to keep your bed as far away from windows as you can. And it's not that you're worried that the bed's going to go sailing out the window. Well, who knows? But you're more concerned about glass breaking and rolling over into broken glass, getting out of bed into broken glass. Some people will keep shoes and a bag tied to their bed, you know, so that they can get into it, but you're still in the bed with a broken glass. So if you can avoid being near a window, that's better. And actually, I saw some years ago an actual um, emergency planning booklet about earthquakes from a mainstream organization who shall remain nameless, where it said, and I quote, keep your bed at least 10 feet away from the closest window. And I thought to myself, well, what city are these people living in where they write something like that? <laughs> you know, a lot of people, your bedroom is not even 10 feet long, but you get the idea. It's not necessarily the most convenient. 
And well, I mean, this tapestry sort of thing, this is not the, the most Martha Stewart approved um, decor, but you know, these are the kinds of, of, of compromises that you make when you live in an earthquake area. So also in this crucial category is, yes, indeed, emergency supplies. And you're thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, I've got that backpack that I got. But it's a lot of times those backpacks aren't good enough. Now, I, I had a backpack years ago. And as time went on and I started thinking about what would I really need if I needed to go and spend time in a shelter or something, um, it's grown quite a bit. It's now not a backpack. It's a rolling duffel bag. This has a telescopic handle you know, and wheels. And so I've got stuff for going to a shelter. And I also have a lot of other supplies that are stationary in the home. And you got to remember that the, the vast majority of times you will ever need your emergency supplies after an earthquake, does, you're not evacuating. They're, you're fine. Your home is fine. But there's, you know, society is stopped for a few days and, you know, the stores are closed and you are basically limited to what you have on hand. So be self-sufficient, right? So I, I put a lot more emphasis really on the, the stationary things. So let's go through that. You, you want food, right? And you can have cans, but cans actually have a surprisingly short life. And I've done the experiments before that, that use by date on the can, sometimes they are true expiration dates. So sometimes you'll open them up a few years later and they're awful. So I really like these MREs, stands for meals ready to eat. It's military rations, but they're also used for emergency relief. And a lot of different companies sell these things now online. The individual meals with lots and lots of different kinds of menus. And they'll have a little heater in it where you put a few drops of water into this packet and it heats up so you can have hot food. They're really pretty good. And as a matter of fact, there, there's, there are some debates about their shelf life. But if you go to the blog, if you want to have some fun, there's a series of articles that I've been adding to over the years about me testing, how, are, the, are the MREs really expired or not? Because when they expire, it doesn't mean that they've gone bad. It just means that they're not as good as they were before in terms of texture and flavor. So frankly, if you know you take an MRE and you open it up when it's new, it's really actually pretty good. And at the end of its stated shelf life, it's kind of like, well, if, if you're happy opening up a can of Chef Boyardee ravioli and eating it, you'll be fine <laughs> with this stuff. Um, I have actually, you can go to the blog and read about my experiences um, I think at this point, it's a 14-year-old MRE that I ate, and I'm still here to talk about it. Um, so go and check that out. It's, it's kind of fun. Also, these uh, food bars, uh, various companies do this. Basically, fat and calories in a bar. They're pretty stable. Then water is a real question, right? The, the official um, estimates that I've heard have been to have a gallon of water per person per day, and, you know, they used to say you should have enough for three days, 72hours.org 72 72 or something like that. And then after um, Hurricane Katrina, they started saying seven days. And after Sandy in New York, they started talking about two weeks. It, there's a limit to what you can do. I, I tend to hit the, the seven day mark. That's just my own comfort level. So that's if you're a couple, that's 14 gallons of water. And where are you going to put that? Especially if you live in a condo or an apartment or something like that. So I've, I've opted for these gallon jugs. I will tell you, um, don't stack them on each other because as I and other people have found out, if the top one is on the bottom one for too long, the bottom one starts to crack and, and there's water everywhere. So I've always managed to put them in a separate layers. They're individually bagged anyways. And the good news is, you know that pesky expiration date or the use by date on these bottles? It's a real pain to dump out 14 gallons of jugs of water and the haul another supply in from the store. Probably, I think still the most popular, the most widely viewed article on my blog is the one where I say that the FDA has said that you could ignore that date. It's an arbitrary date, a completely arbitrary date put on by the bottlers. Um, it's fine at the end of it. It's fine going through. There, there's no BPA in the plastic. Disclaimer, there's always a possibility that they'll discover other plasticizers that will create problems. And there are some you know, studies that get done. But for an emergency situation, something you're not going to be taking uh, you know, frequently in your life, you're really not at risk from drinking water that comes out of an unopened one gallon commercially bottled bottle of water.
Okay. And if it tastes a little odd when you open it up, it just means it's lost its aeration. Take the cap off, let some air in, cap it again, shake it up, and it will taste better. Okay, now I always apologize for the slide. I've never figured out how to make it interesting. So <laughs> it's just a, a list of things that, that I have in my kit that you might think about. I'm gonna try to rush through it. And the handout that Lori will email to people after this has this list on it. So food, water for three to seven days, can opener if you have cans, utensils, first aid kit. A lot of this is pretty straightforward. I would like to highlight cash. Um, you got to assume that after a big quake, the ATMs won't work, the credit card readers won't work, and you might even be paying for things at the corner store with, only with cash on hand. So have cash and have it in small bills because that way you won't blow an entire $20 bill on a battery, right? Um, do, you can decide how much you want to stash away. Um, emergency blankets, if you think you're going to be cold, these don't take up much room. Lots of solutions for radios and flashlights that are crank crankable or solar charged, but batteries also. Light sticks are good and they've got um, the old fashioned ones. They also have LED battery powered ones. They last a long time. I like to have a whistle and just uh, remember my mother was stuck in her apartment after the Northridge quake and her neighbor knew to come get her out. But if no one had come, the phones weren't working. She would have had to let people know she was there and a whistle is very small and very loud. Pocket knife is good. Having supplies so that if you do leave your place, you can write a note, put it in a Ziploc bag, tape it on the outside so it's rainproof. Um, rain ponchos that fold up are good. Vitamins, personal medications. I want to actually pause and highlight this because this is a really important concept. After a, a big disaster, even when the drugstore is reopened, the supply chains can have can have problems. And we've all seen from the pandemic that supply chains are a big deal, right? Even before the pandemic, I was hearing it could take up to two weeks for those drugstores to get their medications back in. And so if you have medications that you absolutely can't just suddenly stop taking, antidepressants, blood pressure, whatever, you could be about to run out when the quake happens. You've got to have, figure out how to have a good like two week extra supply. And I realize that for some of these, it can be difficult. Um, you just have to figure it out because the the uh, alternative is cold turkey, right? Personal sanitary supplies, that's toilet paper and things like that. I've got an article in my blog that I did a few years ago about what to do about toilets. You might wanna go check it out, it's kind of amusing. Spare eye classes, things for pets. Out of town contact info. If you rent landlord contact info. Have a family emergency plan. You always hear about this and I'm, it's different for every person. I can't really tell you what to do, but know if you're a group of people, a family unit, the quake happens when you're not home and you can't get home, where are you gonna meet? Have your insurance info backed up. Power failure backup lights, I really I really like these. I'm, I'm not talking about flashlights that live in the wall and are always charged. I'm talking about these lights. This is an old one. Now they've got the LEDs that are better. These lights that live in your outlet and they're off as long as there's power to them and charging. But if the power goes out or if you pull it out of the socket, then they light up and these LEDs, they'll last for hours. So it means that you'll never wake up to a dark room in an earthquake. And they're also actually great for just regular power failures. I've really benefited from the ones that I have in every room. Lastly, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, corded telephone and landline service that used to be advice. And as more and more people ditch their landlines, it's becoming harder and harder to, to really justify. I mean, we, we have landline service and we have a corded phone just in case, but even the landline service nowadays is battery backups. So it's getting harder and harder to justify this. Okay. Thank you for bearing with that. Um, the, the last thing in this crucial um, category is water heater, bracing the water heaters. A lot of water heaters that looked like this fell over in Loma, Loma Prieta and Northridge quakes. So they, you know, I keep saying they, I mean the people who give this advice, I just reported. They have said, and we're not even gonna try to tell you how to brace a water heater. Go to your hardware store and tell them you need to brace a water heater and they'll give you what you need. Simple as that. Okay, next category down. Picture hooks, big deal. What do you do about pictures? Remember those pictures that came crashing down in the, that I told you about in the Silmar quake. So when you've got a picture on a wire or anything on a hook or a nail, it just jumps and falls off. These maze picture hooks are really neat. 
they're a piece of plastic from the front, from the side, and it's a maze hook. So you can either nail them in here, or there's a hole there you can screw it into a to a stud. But the picture wire goes into this maze, and if the picture jumps around, it's really hard for this to come out. So it'll jump around, but it won't fall. Um, to, to put them on, you just grab the wire on both sides, and it's easy to thread in, and it's actually pretty easy to unthread it when you need to take it off. Oh, but but don't use that as an excuse to hang a heavy picture over the head of your bed because nothing is foolproof, right? More recent years, I've been experimenting with and liking these command strips, the, the style that's like a double Velcro thing. Um, these are really nice, and uh, they result in having a picture on the wall that has no motion whatsoever. So it's not going to be flopping around. And assuming that you use one that, the you know, rated for the, the weight of the object you're putting up, it, it's pretty good. And you can go to my blog again and look for these command strips or for pictures, and you'll see a bunch of videos that I took of myself holding a piece of drywall, which I had painted with the same paint in my condo, in which I have stuck various pictures to it in different ways, and I'm shaking it around as much as I can to see what works. These did remarkably well. You need to have a flat, solid back for them to work. They're pretty impressive. I'd say about half of the pictures in my current home are on maze picture hooks, and the other half are on these. Okay, bookcases, you're supposed to brace them to the wall at the top to prevent this from happening. Um, right at the top there, there are commercial, commercially available products that make it pretty easy to do this. I, I'm not endorsing this one company, but they really do seem to have the, the, the most of the products out there. It's what you'll probably find. This is a good product. It's a very, very sticky Velcro. And the other side of the Velcro is a strap that you bolt to the wall into a wall stud, not the, uh, not the drywall, because the thing will just pull right out. And in case you don't know how to work with wall studs, I've got a big, long article in my blog about how to deal with wood wall studs, metal wall studs, et cetera. So you go check, check that out. And it's nice because there's a little bit of play, first of all, and you can undo the Velcro if something falls behind there and you need to get to it. This also goes for file cabinets and anything else that you don't want to fall down. Then when it comes to th things that are blocky that you want to stick to a surface, a bunch of different kinds of products. They used to have these buckles and straps, which have been, I think, largely supplanted by this one side as a buckle and the other side is Velcro. There's also these double-sided Velcro blocks. And uh, also the, I don't have a slide for this, but the grippy, grippy material, they have some like super industrial strength grippy blocks that can help stack things like that. For flat panel monitors and TVs, I kind of half agree with this. This this company markets this product for both. And for a flat panel TV, there's usually a wall behind it. So the fact that it's preventing it from falling forward and not backward is probably fine. But for a flat panel monitor, frequently it's in the middle of the room. So this is a great idea from the US Geological Survey. That's the buckles and straps on the base. That's what I tend to do. Here's a very old, very old picture now, a Dell monitor that I had that moved around, swiveled and things like that. I had them on the base. And then if you think about what's on your shelves, um, it would take a pretty big quake to make things fly off of the shelf. But even in a smaller quake that sets up vibrations, objects can walk forward and fall, and that can cause various problems. So in my desk, I'm actually sitting right now, right here, looking exactly at this thing that I'm showing you. This is kind of surreal. Um, there's a picture wire here on two screw eyes, and that prevents the books from moving forward. And if I want a book, I just pick it up. And more recently, in more recent years, I found this nice product. It's essentially a good looking bungee cord with plastic end caps that you crimp onto the ends, and then you screw that to the furniture. So it prevents things from moving. If I want to pull out a book, I just pull down the strap. But if there was an earthquake and everything started moving forward at the same time, it would hold them in. And people have been doing this with ugly bungee cords, you know, on bookcases for years, but th this actually looks better. Now, th I'm, I'm dating this talk. You can see how long ago I put this talk together. I don't have whole cases of CDs anymore, but I show this for a reason. Why did I have my CDs behind these things? I mean, they fall down, you pick them up, who cares, right? The reason is that for a number of years at different times, I've had a small dog in the family and it occurred to me years ago that if the small dog was underneath this and looking up, all these sharp plastic corners coming, falling down 
could actually be harmful. And so you've got to keep the smaller people in the family um, in mind, the, the um, two-legged and four-legged variety, right? And if you go to my blog, you'll actually see a reprinted article that I did many years ago for the Kolb hardware newsletter that, that people used to get in the mail about extra precautions you can take for your pets if they're home alone, they're there when the earthquake occurs and you're not there. What can you do to make sure that they won't get in trouble? Okay, next cabinet, uh, next category down. And I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to end this, I think about 305, I think is where we're pushing for. Um, cabinet latches, you think about this, you might have very difficult cabinets to open. They might be magnetic latches or stiff latches or, or whatever. But in a quake, especially with everything trying to fall out, push their way out, all of the stuff comes out. And a lot of people have found this out the hard way. So if you think about all those oils and liqueurs and condiments and glasses and plates and everything behind your cabinet doors, that's going to be all over the place and in a big mess. My dad took days cleaning up his kitchen after the Northridge quake for this. So some people will put in the childproof latches where you, 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 you have to let the door open an inch and stick your fingers in and move a lever. Okay, that works, but I, I like to cook. I'm in and out of the cabinets all the time. It's just too inconvenient for me. So there are two kinds of cabinet latches that I've really liked. One of them is the push latch, otherwise known as a touch latch. It's a, a claw and a peg. And here's a, oh, well, here's a, here's a picture from a recent quake showing what happens if you don't do this. Okay, I forgot I had added that picture. Um, here's a video showing how it works. You can't pull it open. But if you push it first, it disengages. Hopefully, you can see the video working. Um, and then you can you you close it, you push it again, and now it can't open, right? So it's really really nice. It's hardly any inconvenience at all. You have to tell people, oh, don't pull that, push it first, right? I like this quite a bit. They're a bit of a pain to install, and so I have a big long article on my blog with tips about how to do it right the first time. And the only issue with these things is there's a theoretical concern that in given the right kind of motion in a quake, these things could flop around and, and self-activate. And I actually did see a simulation of a Japanese quake where you know, there were cameras inside and outside, and I've, I've witnessed this occur, so I know it's possible. There are ways to install them that minimize that, but it is possible. And so I was really interested when I heard about this Japanese latch, a Murakoshi latch, that I actually have in my current place. I, I've, I've put these in, I really like them. If you go to the blog, you can read all about them. The basic idea is this is that there are latches out there where an earthquake will make something fall into place to catch it. And I don't trust those. I think it takes too long for something to fall into place. This works backwards. This, there's a little pendulum in the middle. And as long as that pendulum is perfectly centered, it can open. If that pendulum is the tiniest, tiniest little bit off center, it, it can't open. This is really quite effective. And I've heard from people who have these in RVs, you know, to stop things from falling out as they're moving, that they really do work. So go to the blog and you can see a lot of information about that. Okay, we're, we're winding, we're getting near the end. Um, earthquake insurance, okay, this is an issue. It makes a lot of sense, right? It's, it's expensive, there are deductibles, but when my mother, who, who was an insurance agent, by the way, but that's, that's you know, not relevant here. Um, when she lost her apartment in the Northridge quake, her earthquake insurance paid for time in a hotel and new possessions and things like that. It was really good for her. It's, it's a calculated risk. Um, your insurance companies presumably are all working through the California Earthquake Authority, who's actually the one that does it. Now, I have to say, I got, see, this is the great thing about doing this from home on my desk. I got this thing in the mail. If, I don't know if you can see it. Well, okay, you might have gotten something like this too from the California Earthquake Authority that basically says, well, from now on, our policy isn't going to be as good as it used to be. Do you want to still have it? <laughs> and I'm a little dist disturbed about that, and I haven't had a chance to look into it too much, but there's an issue there, and I'm, I'm not sure what it means yet. Last category down, sticking things to surfaces, loose objects. This might seem overkill, but consider that in the um, Silmar quake, we had a couple of things fall off shelves, but in the Northridge quake, in almost the same place, uh, my mother tells me that every loose object on a surface turned into a high-speed projectile that flew across the room. Quite scary. And so you can stick things down with various products, like this guy is stuck down with, with quake putty. 
Um, and it's a bunch of these products where you, you can push down and twist a little bit and then you can't pick it up, you can't knock it over. But if you want to, you just pull up and you twist a little and it comes right off. And if stuff stays behind, you can take more of it and dab at it, different for each product. I will tell you that while I'm not endorsing any particular product or company, I can unendorse something. Uh, I will warn you about this museum wax. It's gunky. It's really hard to clean up. It leaves oil slicks. I, I don't use this. It's a real pain. Um, I like the putties. The uh, Quake putty, Quake hold putty, museum putty, amazing stuff. They're all very similar. White putty. You form it. You take little dabs of it. You put it in the place. Really quite nice. It's not clear. So if you're putting down something that's clear, it looks ugly. So there's this one clear quake hold gel where it looks like water, but you literally, you, you can pull the water of that stuff out. It turns cloudy and then it clears up again with time. Um, you, can, you can go to my blog and read all about the considerations of these things. Remember, don't use this to put something on a wall or horizontal surface. This is to prevent things from moving on a surface, on a, a vertical surface. No, or, wait, let me try that again. Don't, don't put things on a vertical wall. It's, it's to stick things down to a horizontal surface, okay? There. Now, what else can you do with these, actually? I'll, I'll tell you one thing. You might have stopped your cabinet doors from opening, but like they say in the airlines, the contents may have shifted, right? So if you have these expensive wine glasses or stuff, some people will use Quake Putty to stick the wine glasses down. And having given that away, I now need to tell you that if you do that, when you pull the wine glasses up, don't pull it up from the top because you'll just break the stem. It's, you got to pull it from the bottom. It's a twist and a tilt, and it's an acquired talent. And if you do this the first time, you'll think, I can't get this thing off. Why did I listen to that idiot? But just keep... Keep experimenting and you'll see twist and tilt. And that means don't have the glasses too close to each other because they need to be able to tilt a little bit to get them off, okay? So, and, and these things, you don't even have to get rid of them. You just peel them off, drop them right there in a little ball on your shelf, and then you can reuse them again afterwards. So they're quite nice. Okay, almost done. Um, I told you that you might need to retrofit your home and I can't give you technical advice about that, but I do recommend that you, if your home is before the early 1970s, at least, that you have someone come out and take a look at it, especially if it's soft story, but even if not, just, just to, to find out if it needs to be retrofitted or not. What else can you do? Consider joining uh, NERT in San Francisco or CERT teams in other areas. This NERT is the first one that grew out of the Loma Prieta quake when uh, a lot of people wanted to help the firefighters who were overstretched and some did help and others just got on the way. And the department decided they would train an army of volunteers so that the next time this happens, um, the citizens would know what to do. And they will train you and the search programs that went nationwide. Um, they will train you in light search and rescue, light triage, first aid, things like that in uh, like six evening sessions or a couple of weekend sessions. And when you're certified to do this, if there's a disaster, like a major earthquake, you check if you and your family and your neighbors are okay. You grab your gear, you go to a predetermined place for your district, and the fire department puts you to work doing the simple things so that they can focus on the hard things. Very, very worthwhile thing to do. Um, the handout that Lori sends out will have some of these links. I'm not necessarily endorsing these companies, but they're good sources of information. I think sometimes these links get out of date, and uh, hopefully if someone tries one and finds that it no longer works, please let me know, because I don't always go and check. But you'll notice down at the bottom, there's my website, um, earthquake.matthewallspringer.com, and the blog, Quake Tips. They talk to each other. I'm not doing much with the website these days other than a presentation schedule. It's most of the emphasis is on the blog. But as you can tell, I like to talk about this stuff. So feel free to email me if you have questions. After this, I'll stick around for questions now. But if you have questions later, feel free to email me. Happy to help you. And your question might even turn into a blog article at one point. And I want to leave you with one closing thought, okay? These, these precautions that we've been talking about are a hassle, right? They're annoying, they're, they're inconvenient. Why would you do all this stuff with this theoretical possibility of an earthquake? Well, I want you to think about those keys that you carry with you everywhere you go. You leave, you lock your door, you carry them in your pocket, your backpack, your purse, whatever. If you lose the keys, you risk locking yourself out of your home. This is really inconvenient. Why are you doing something so inconvenient? It's because you're worried that your house is going to get robbed. 
right? Think about it. The, the chances that you're going to get burglarized are probably less on, on an aggregate than the chances that you'll one of these days experience one of these quakes. So I think it makes sense, common sense, just to, to make the precautions that you take match the risks that you face. And with that, I will close. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I see there are some questions in the chat, but you know what I'd like to do is just to, to well, I guess we can go through the questions in the chat first. Laurie, do you want to moderate that? Yes. There's and then people could raise their hands afterwards. Yes. Yeah. There's one question from Maureen. Um, what is the average cost for soft story retrofit? Oh, that's an excellent question. And I do not know the answer. Thousands thousands, but I, I just don't know. I, I found an article from uh, the Chronicle. It says the typical soft story retrofit can cost between 14,000 to 27,000. I'll send a link, okay. uh, a link to the article. And, and you should be aware that there are different programs or grant programs in San Francisco, maybe California, I'm not sure, that, that come up every now and then to, to help defray the costs, at least with low interest loans, to help defray the, defray the costs of the retrofits. The, the reason that, you know, some of these retrofits are actually required. So a, a number of years ago, and was it San Francisco or, or a larger area? I'm not sure. They mandated that units of with a certain number of, of uh, that is buildings with a certain number of units with certain kinds of constructions had to be retrofitted. And the reason is that if these things all come down in a quake, there's going to be a homeless crisis that puts to pale anything that we're currently facing right now. We said that um, retrofit cost depends upon the amount of work needed. Our three-story apartment building was um, over 60,000. 60,000, wow. Yeah, over 60,000. Yeah. Boy. Yeah, and you know, this is an issue. When I first heard that they were going to mandate this, I was thinking to myself, well, what do you do for the people who are just barely making ends meet that just don't have that kind of money? I, <laughs> you know, you can see there's a problem there. I don't think there's an easy answer to it. But those who have the ability or who can get the right grants or loans, it's worthwhile. Yeah, I, I got I'm going to give you one more little story. One of the first times I ever gave this talk, I was amused at this. Someone came down to me and asked me a question at the at the end, and he said, "Well, that was really interesting, but this bit about retrofitting your home, why is it in the least important category instead of the most important category? I mean, what's the point of taking all these precautions if your house falls down?" And I told them, "Well, it's not that it's not important. It's just it's not cheap and it's not easy, and you're not going to do it today, <laughs> right? So that's why it's in the lowest category. But that doesn't don't don't make that don't feel then that it's not important." Uh, that's the only question um, in the chat. If you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand and unmute. Oh, I see another question from Maureen. Do you know about the Brace and Bolt program? I got an email. Want to know if it's legit. Seems to need seems you need to have a cross space to qualify. I don't have a cross space in my Richmond district home. Gee, no, I I don't know about the Brace and Bolt program by name. Um, is that one of the, the grant programs? This maybe if Maureen did, can, yeah, you can feel free to unmute and, and have a real, com real comment. Is Maureen still? Yeah, yes. Hi there, it's Maureen. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll make myself uh, visible mm -hmm. here in a second. Um, sure. Yeah, I've got an, um, it's, let's see, if I'm trying to go on to my, uh, email um okay it says earthquake brace and bolt.com and it says if you have any questions please contact customer service at info earthquake brace.com and it gives an 800 number 877 and it says time is limited to register um, i got that on january 14th and i stuck mm -hmm. you know, it mentions, um, you know, it's got this, the Cal OES here, and uh, um, I could maybe, uh, um, I don't know, um, email it to you or something. But well, I you know, actually, I just looked it up. I mean, as you were talking, oh. I put it into a browser. I see it. I, it looks, I know mean, it looks legit. I mean, I guess, I guess I would have to say these days, double check. Yeah, I'm a little. But, but I know that there are programs like this. 
Yeah. So, yeah. The one thing it says is that when I, I was filling the information out, um, but I don't have it. It look kind of looks like maybe you have to have a crawl space to qualify, because it stopped me. It wouldn't let me go any further when I, you know, I really? asked if you had a crawl space. And I, there's no oh, crawl that's... space. Like, yeah, that's interesting. I guess maybe that. Let's see. It says these programs provide grants for a specific building code compliant seismic retrofit. So it looks like they are, they're not talking about just retrofitting in general, seismic retrofitting in general. It looks like it really is specific to that one flaw from what I can tell. But, you know, I, I, I hesitate to give too much advice about this because I'm totally not qualified to discuss the technical aspects of, um, of the retrofitting. Do you know yeah, where, who we might contact about that? Because, um, you know, I have like, you know, it's a soft story, you know, one, like a lot of the houses in the Richmond and the Sunset where there's the garage and the tunnel yeah. and you go up the stairs and there's that um, one story or sometimes two stories. Yeah, there's there's a, um, well, I mean, I know I, I know of people who do this, these inspections, but I, I, I'm always a little bit reluctant to to get into, you know, personal referrals in this sort of thing as a conflict of interest, but there should be a citywide resource. Let me try to remember what it is. Um, maybe, you know, I, I could look after the talk. I can check in some of my bookmarks and see if I can find it. Because the best thing to do would be to go to San, through San Francisco. I know also that hardware stores will refer you to contractors. But, you know, as I've been walking around the neighborhood, I keep seeing the same names pop up. There's this this thing, this truck that I see around in various places in the Richmond district that's got a, 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 a seismograph logo on it. I forget what it's called. So I know there are organizations out there that do it. But I, I imagine you're going to want to check several places because the costs, the estimates might vary quite a bit. And I've never had to do it, so I don't have any personal uh, experience to go off of. I found this article. Um, funds to strengthen your... Well, somebody put um, something in the chat, funds to strengthen your foundation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You, you're welcome. Yeah, it's from the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services. I believe it's legit. It talks about the Brazen Bolt grant program. I didn't read the Great. entire article, but you can uh, look into that. Yeah. Great, thanks, yeah. Take that up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, DBI, I see that, that comment, DBI would assist, yeah. DBI has had his own, DBI has had some problems, <laughs> as you probably are aware. Um, you might not want to go through DBI. DBI. Okay. I, would, I would go just may, maybe the uh, the actual um, the actual emergency planning in, in the city is might be the best way to do it. And, and how do you contact them? Well, that's what I was going to try to look up oh. after. You can send a link out. I mean, you know, you've heard all that. There's a, bit, a lot of scandals at DBI with people. Wow. Yeah. So presumably they've fixed that, but I, I would, it just gave me a little bit of a hmm, feeling that I would want to look elsewhere. So yeah, I can look into it and send Lori a link to send out. Oh, Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you so much, Matt. Yeah, we, really, we really appreciate you taking the time to share with us how to prepare for an earthquake. And I also want to thank everyone for joining the program. I hope you all find the presentation uh, helpful to you. I will send out Matt's pen out uh, and your evaluation survey and um, the recording link to everyone um, in maybe 15 minutes. Uh, please feel free uh, to respond to the survey um, so we can continue to improve our programming. Again, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye now.